Welcome to 12 questions for May 12. With us today, we have Patricia Contreras Tejada, who works on quantum information at the Institute of Mathematical Science of the Spanish National Research Agency. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you about, about the stereotype threat. This happens when a, person's, a person feels personally as, at risk to confirm a negative feature about a social group to which they belong. How do you think this affects you in your job? Well, so there are several experiments, right, done where people um, sit the same te test, but they somehow sit it in a different context. Um, and so the participants are split into groups and in some of the groups, different stereotypes are made salient. So for example, um, you might have a group of people um, composed of both women and men, and it to half of the participants or to a third of the participants, you don't say anything for the control group, to a third you say that you're testing their creativity, and to the other third you say that you're testing their technical ability. And it turns out that in, to the participants to whom you've said that you're testing the technical ability, men perform much better on maths tests than women. Whereas if you say that they're testing their creativity, women might perform at least as well as men. Um, and again, the differences are, um, well, can be seen with respect to the control group, right? And this is quite interesting because of course the exam is the same. Um, and there's several reasons for this. Uh, one is a physiological stress response that directly impairs some prefrontal processing that is needed for the test in the context where the stereotype affects you negatively. So there's a stereotype that uh, women are bad at technical ability, and so being tested on it might um, make you perform badly at it. Um, there's also a tendency to actively monitor your performance if you think that you're being tested on something that you're not meant to be good at. Um, and also the efforts to suppress negative thoughts and emotions in the surface of self-regulation might also impair your performance in the test. Again, if you're negatively affected by the stereotype. Um, that's been make, made salient. Um, and of course, women who start doing maths research are constantly aware that their technical ability is being tested because it's tested all the time, from their PhD interviews to meetings with supervisors to the first time you lecture. So this is, you know, um, women are at clear risk of triggering their stereotype threat. And of course, when I say women, I also say other minorities which um, where similar stereotypes might, may apply. Um, and what's more, even more interesting about stereotype threat is that subtle hints about the stereotype also work. And this is one of the reasons why it's controversial, whether having only one woman on an interview panel or a PhD committee is beneficial, or it actually tr triggers stereotype threat, so it makes no or negative difference for the female candidates in this case, right? Um, and so by subtle, I mean, so the same idea with the test, might be done where the women in the group are reminded of where the toilet is or something. And if the toilet is separated by gender, that might remind them that indeed they are a woman. Um, so that might trigger the stereotype threat. And in a similar way, if you have an interview panel where there's only one woman and it's a big panel, uh, you might feel that minority difference, right? So you might feel, oh, I'm also part of the minority just like she is, um, and therefore my gender is made salient, so I might underperform. Um, yeah, so stereotype threat affects us basically all the time. The imposter phenomenon describes the belief women and members of other minorities frequently have of being intellectual frauds, despite objective evidence of success. This leads to anxiety, fear of failure, and dissatisfaction with life. Has this phenomenon affected you personally? And um, what can we do to tackle it? Yeah, so in my master's degree, I was the only woman out of five in my course. And the other four I felt were not only men, but also um, somehow had studied at more prestigious universities. And well, I felt like they knew more than me and I felt really like I didn't belong there. Um, but fortunately I was aware of something called the imposter phenomenon. Um, and so I was somehow able to detect the cause of my negative feelings. And I kept reminding myself that I was 
I had been deemed apt for the course, just like the rest. So, you know, that although my, I might feel like I didn't belong, I couldn't know that much less than the rest of them, right? Um, and it was exactly this awareness that kept my motivation during the course. And indeed, I think that raising awareness about phenomena like these, phenomena like these, um, is exactly what helps so that you can talk to others and have some certain level of understanding, right? Because if we're all aware that this is a problem, then, well, I can certainly talk to you about it and I don't need to explain um, why this happens to me and not you if you're not part of a minority or something like that, right? Um, and I also found it very useful to have other friends on maybe other courses who were going through similar feelings um, because, well, at least we could have some sort of support network, right, and support each other and share um, what was uh, going wrong and what we were doing to, to tackle it. And Patricia, do you know some initiatives to deal with those situations? Yeah, so, so I wanted to talk about one particular very positive experience I had in terms of diversity and in terms of tackling these, um, these things that affect it. And it's a conference that I went to. It's called Q-Turn, Changing Paradigms in Quantum Science. And well, the majority of invited talks and contributed talks were given by people from underrepresented groups in the quantum information community. And the way this was done, well, obviously the invited talks were chosen, but, the, um, but for the contributed talks, the scientific committee was not only diverse, but also made aware of their own implicit biases uh, when reviewing the paper. So they were asked to keep an eye on whether they were always picking the, um, the same you know, white guy or whatever. Um, also, it probably helped that people from underrepresented backgrounds uh, would submit to this conference more on average than to any other conference. Uh, so they probably had more people to choose from. Uh, but still, you know, again, this awareness of, of what might affect diversity probably helped. And what was interesting about this conference was, well, first of all, it was scientifically very interesting. So it wasn't only centered on diversity, which was uh, a comment I got a lot, like, oh, so you went to this conference, uh, was there any science in it? Yes, there definitely was a lot of science. Um, but it was also very interesting socially um, because I really felt like I belonged. And I was surprised to see that I felt like I belong way more than usually, um, which helped me realize that I usually don't feel like I fully belong in conferences. And so this was quite, uh, quite remarkable, aside from obviously the, the good feeling that it is to belong somewhere, right? Um, and something else that was good about the conference was that there were talks on mental health and on cognitive biases and on impossible phenomena and stereotype threats and all these things that we're talking about today, right? And this made it okay and even expected to talk to other participants and have deep discussions about these topics, which is really rare at normal conferences and even just normally in the academic community. And this, well, first of all, reinforced the sense of belonging, which was positive in itself, but it also helped tone down the phenomena like imposter phenomenon and stereotype threat, right? Because you suddenly felt like you weren't part of a minority somehow. Um, so I, I really think that we should be organizing more conferences of this kind.